Often we see scenes in the natural world that are impressive. They have a powerful emotional impact on us. It might be the sublime sense of an elevated thought or the response to something quite breathtaking. The images we see here are awesome or they might simply have that wow factor. In Jurassic Park, Steven Spielberg showed this impressively when the paleontologists who spent all their lives digging in the dirt for fossils encounter a recreated live specimen of the dinosaur. They experience this great sense of awe. Think about how you might express your thoughts and feelings when you've been impressed. Divide your page into four and label each section below with joy, wonder, awe and intimidation. Now consider how you would group these words. A lot of these words are used regularly when we talk, when we speak, when we express our feelings in response to something amazing. Try putting them in the pages in the boxes on the pages that you separated. Which do you associate with joy or wonder? Some of them are appropriate to be used in an exam. Some are a bit colloquial or too chatty. Think about which words you could use when writing. Perhaps some of your words were grouped like this. There's not really a right answer, it's how you express your emotions. Avoid using the green words here, for they are too colloquial or chatty, and you should try to be more formal and use an ambitious vocabulary. We're now going to look at H's for Hawk by Helen MacDonald. Whilst recovering from the grief she felt when she lost her father, she decides to raise and train a hawk. The passage explores her emotional feelings and her response when she first meets the bird. H is for hawk. We'll check the ring numbers against the article tens, he explained, pulling a sheaf of yellow paper from his rucksack and unfolding two of the official forms that accompany captive bred rare birds throughout their lives. Don't want you going home with the wrong bird. We noted the numbers. We stared down at the boxes at their parcel five tape handles, their doors of thin plywood and hinges of carefully tied string. Then he knelt on the concrete, untied a hinge on the smaller box and squinted into its dark interior. A sudden thump of feathered shoulders and the box shook as if someone had punched it hard from within. She's got her hood off, he said, and frowned. That light leather hood was to keep the hawk from fearful sights like us. Another hinge untied. Concentration. Infinite caution. Daylight irrigating the box, scratching talons, another thump and another thump. The air turned syrupy slow, flecked with dust, the last few seconds before a battle. And with the last bow pulled free, he reached inside and amidst a whirring chaotic clatter of wings and feet, and talons and a high-pitched twittering and it's all happening at once the man pulls an enormous enormous hawk out of the box and in a strange coincidence of world and deed a great flood of sunlight drenches us and everything is brilliance and fury the hawk's wings barred and beating the sharp fingers of her dark-tipped primaries cutting the air, her feathers raised like the scattered quills of a fretful porpentine. 
two enormous eyes. My heart jumps sideways. She is a conjuring trick, a reptile, a fallen angel, a griffin from the pages of an illuminated bestiary, something bright and distant like gold falling through water, a broken marionette of wings, legs and light splashed feathers. She's wearing jessies and the man holds them. For one awful long moment she is hanging head downward, wings open like a turkey in a butcher's shop. Only her head is turned right way up and she is seeing more than she has ever seen before in her whole short life. Her world was an aviary no larger than a living room. Then it was a box. But now it is this, and she can see everything. The point source glitter on the waves, a diving cormorant a hundred yards out, pigment flakes under wax on the lines of parked cars, far hills and the heather on them and the miles and miles of sky where the sun spreads on dust and water and illegible things moving in it that are white scraps of gulls everything startling and new stamped on her entirely astonished brain through all this the man was perfectly calm he gathered up the hawk in one practised movement, folding her wings, anchoring her broad feathered back against his chest, gripping her scaled yellow legs in one hand. Let's get that hood back on, he said tautly. There was concern in his face. It was born of care. The hawk had been hatched in an incubator had broken from a frail bluish eggshell into a humid perspex box and for the first few days of her life this man had fed her with scraps of meat held in a pair of tweezers waiting patiently for the lumpen fluffy chick to notice the food and eat her new neck wobbling with the effort of keeping her head in the air all at once i loved this man and fiercely I grabbed the hood from the box and turned to the hawk. Her beak was open, her hackles raised, her wild eyes were the colour of the sun on white paper, and they stared because the whole world had fallen into them at once. One, two, three. I tucked the hood over her head. There was a brief intimation of a thin, angular skull under her feathers and of an alien brain fizzing and fusing with terror, and then I drew the braces closed. We checked the thing, ring, we checked the ring numbers 45 against the form. It was the wrong bird. This was the younger one, the smaller one. This was not my hawk. Oh. So we put her back and opened the other box, which was meant to hold the larger, older bird. And dear God, it did. Everything about this second hawk was different. She came out like a Victorian melodrama, a sort of mad woman in the attic. She was smokier and darker and much, much bigger. And instead of twittering, she wailed. Great, awful gouts of sound, like a thing in pain. And the sound was unbearable. This is my hawk, I was telling myself, and it was all I could do to breathe. She too was bareheaded, and I grabbed the hood from the box as before. But as I brought it up to her face, I looked into her eyes and saw something blank and crazy in her stare, some madness from a distant country. I didn't recognise her. This isn't my hawk. This hood, the hood was on, the ring numbers checked, the bird back in the box, the yellow form folded, the money exchanged, and all I could think of was, but this isn't my hawk. Slow panic. I knew what I had to say, and it was a monstrous breach of etiquette. This is really awkward, I began, but I really like the first one. Do you think there's any chance I could take that one instead? I tailed off. 
His eyebrows were raised. I started again, saying stupider things. I'm sure the other falconer would like the larger bird. She's more beautiful than the first one, isn't she? I know it's out of order, but I... Could I? Would it be all right, do you think? And on and on, a desperate, crazy barrage of incoherent appeals. I'm sure nothing I said persuaded him more than the look on my face as I said it. A tall, white-faced woman with wind-wrecked hair and exhausted eyes was pleading with him on a quayside, hands held out as if she were in a seaside production of Medea. Looking at me, he must have sensed that my stuttered request wasn't a simple one. There was something behind it that was very important. There was a moment of total silence. In the exam room, you'll need to remember to analyse all of the key features of a non-fiction text, especially on the unseen text that you won't have been taught. A useful acronym to remember how to approach this is PASCO. Here's Mr. PASCO. And PASCO stands for Purpose, Audience, Style, Content, Organisation and English. By using that acronym, you'll be able to think and plan and focus on the key aspects of what will get you credit in an exam. When you're studying a text in the classroom, you'll have time to look more closely at each paragraph. It's quite a good idea to number the paragraphs and think about what is happening in each one. What is the focus? How the writer has structured it and developed it? How it engages you and helps you to move from one focus to a different focus? And how your emotional reaction changes in that process? Question four of the exam will ask you to think about one of the set texts that you've studied and it will particularly look at how you have been encouraged to engage or with that text or interest you as a reader. So as you read each text, study and consider what is it that makes it exciting, interesting, engaging or at least creates some emotional response for you. In H is for Hawk, Think about which of the following you are encouraged to experience or feel in each paragraph. Is it a sense of beauty, excitement, the nervousness? Is it information that's useful and interesting? Is there any tension or enthusiasm? Notice when the sympathy of the bird is aroused and the questions and thoughts and feelings of the narrator. And as you do that, Look at which precise words add embellishment to reinforce that. Is there a sense of hyperbole? You might want to pause the video here to look at each paragraph carefully. There are eight paragraphs in H is for Hawk. Number them, look through, identify the focus of each and think about the emotional impact and what it is that engages you or interests you paragraph by paragraph. And then look at the stylistic devices in that text and think, can I identify any of these? One way in which you can prepare for the exam is to be able to write an overview of the text in a few sentences. Can you sum up what is the purpose? What is the audience? What is the impact of that text on you as a reader? Have a look at H's for Hawk and see if you can use any of the words listed at the top of this slide to write a couple of sentences to say what is happening and how it engages you. In this picture, you can see some of the technical information that we're given in the text. The bird on the right is hooded so that she is safe and secure rather like the blinkers on a horse. Similarly, the braces pull that hood tight around the head and hold it in place. 
The jesses on the bird on the left, you can see, wrapped around her legs. They allow the falconer to hold the bird securely and control her when they're outside. Helen MacDonald begins her recount with the direct voice of the falconer. His statements show he is professional, a person she admires for his procedure, his passion and the birds that he rears. The technical information shows his need to do things legally and professionally with any captive birds that he breeds. So the birds are ringed and they're identified with the official permits, the Arctical Tens. This officialdom and reference portrays MacDonald's desire to do things legally, properly. Yet the yellow highlighted dialogue also prefigures the conflict and tension that will come later in the passage. There is a mention of the wrong bird and her desire to change the bird, which is what it goes on to, to develop. The verbs in orange are helped in the narrative retelling and structure the events the explaining, the unfolding, and it gives status as she looks up to the falconer doing these things. The narrative events then unfold in paragraph two. As the past tense verbs noted, stared, untied and knelt retell this procedure, we understand how the narrative develops. That is until we reach the engaging and more dramatic, the box shook and he frowned, which conveys the growing tension that there is something wrong. The passage is made more interesting through the added details of thin plywood and carefully tied strings, which suggest a flimsy, possibly delicate container in contrast to the unseen bird's power. The bird's power is conveyed in the sudden thump and the hard punch and the simile as if someone had punched it adds to this sense of the power of an unseen bird that is de devastating and it elevates our expectation. Whilst MacDonald is quite intimidated by this, the situation is flipped because it is the bird that is actually afraid and ironically being unhooded it is the humans that she is potentially afraid of shown in the fearful sights like us paragraph three is the longest in the whole extract as you go through this look carefully at the examples of embellishments or hyperbole that she uses to convey her excitement, fear, shock, or the tension. The paragraph has extensive, detailed, complex sentences, words, and structures that elevate the bird's status in our reading. It aggrandizes the bird, elevating it to a superior position in our impression. And these are all shown through the complex language and sentence structures. After the sudden thump of the last paragraph and the tension that is drawing forward the drama, we have an encounter with the hawk itself, and that is conveyed through the repeated use of noun phrases. After the hinge is untied, we have concentration, infinite caution, daylight irrigating the box, scratching talons, another thump and another. Each of these lists simply a thing that we experience and see in our mind. The list of noun phrases is building the tension and then we have sudden sounds and actions washed in dramatic sunlight leading up to the onomatopoeic thump which you can see in yellow on the screen. This drama shows with the ad adjectives and the sibilance of syrupy slow and the harsher consonants of flecked with dust. That slowing down at that moment conveys a sense of the hawk's impact on its environment. We're then told in a further noun phrase that this is the last few seconds before a battle. The military metaphor suggests a conflict or danger and excitement. 
There then follows an extensive five-line sentence with multiple clauses and repeated use of the connective and to layer the action and to build the underriding tension of these events. This is made even more dramatic with the switch from the past to the present tense. The man pulls the bird out and the sunlight drenches the scene, creating an immediacy. Similarly, the sounds of the revelation are onomatopoeic with whirring and the alliteration of the chaotic clatter enhances the drama. There's also the simple repetition of enormous to suggest the bird's size. It is impressive. The enormous, enormous hawk. More alliter alliteration of the plosives B is used in barred beating, which dramatise the sounds of the flapping bird. And more plosives still add tension in the dark-tipped primaries cutting the air, as if the bird also has power to cut the natural world. This is then illustrated with a simile comparing the bird to an angry por porpentine, the creature like a porcupine that's hostile, alarmed and threatening. The noun phrases list the features of the bird in a less coherent but dramatic impression of enormous eyes. As we see the bird from Helen MacDonald's perspective, she is impressed by it. She conveys her emotional response and the present tense verb, my heart jumps, reveals the awesome, captivating nature of the hawk before her. The metaphor states that she, the bird, is a conjuring trick, yet it is ironically not a rabbit pulled out of a hat. And the noun phrases add to this with the image of a reptile, a fallen angel, a griffin, a mysterious creatures from mythology. These convey the power, exotic nature and almost mystical sense of this bird. It's not quite real, not quite ordinary and strangely inverted. The broken marionette metaphor conveys her in her upside down state, which is a comic aberration of the bird. Similarly, we see that later in the simile like a turkey in a butcher's shop. Here you can see some pictures from an ancient medieval illuminated book. The bestiaries were illustrated books of real and mythical beasts, plants and rocks. They were strange, exaggerated, but to us quite interesting, exciting. And she uses that imagery to convey the sense and impression of the hawk at this point. The power, strangeness and dominance of the bird's presence captivates MacDonald and she vividly portrays this in her language and sentence structure. Here she uses the progressive verbs is hanging and is seeing, which allow us to focus on the bird's perspective. And we begin to realise that the world from the bird's point of view is shown in a triplet of how she has experienced the world, moving from the world was an aviary to a living room, then a box. Until this moment, now she is released into a bright, sunny situation. MacDonald makes this release of the bird a dramatic moment. She uses the temporal marker, but now and it is in this moment, the deictic pronoun this, pointing to that very moment, which adds to the excitement and the drama of the situation. This is the encounter and the moment that is central to the passage. We're then told that the bird can see everything. A colon introduces a list of phrases that paint the picture of the landscape and the setting. But it's all from the hawk's perspective. The hawk is the epicentre of the dramatic moment. The list ends with two noun phrases that stamp the impression 
of the uh, on the reader's consciousness everything is startling and new stamped on the entirely astonished brain it is the bird's brain that is central these phrases show MacDonald's empathy joy and engagement with the bird that captivates and excites her so completely the bird is all to her at this moment look back at your passage at the similes and the metaphors the comparisons the writer has used to convey the the stunning wonder at seeing this bird the scattered quills of the fretful pulpentine the gold falling through water and then the metazor, metaphors of the fallen angel the griffin the reptile contrasted with the turkey upside down and the broken marinette all of these convey a sense of her beauty and wonderment at seeing the bird the fourth paragraph is not quite so lengthy but it is focused on the Faulkner and MacDonald's appreciation of him the shift back to the past tense reduces the drama and tension which eases now as he was perfectly calm and the careful verbs of folding anchoring and grasping are written in the progressive or continuous form which all show his measured and skillful control the dialogue also conveys a hint of concern about the hawk's, hawk's lack of hood with let's get that hood on back on but it is a measured practical tone and is only a slight degree of tension added in the adverb tautly the man's expertise is shown in the abstract nouns of concern and care and he exudes these things and exhibits them throughout it is enhanced by the alliteration of the hard c which is clinical professional macdonald then recounts the anecdote of how this man has raised the chick feeding it raising it with the adverb patiently added showing a sense of respect the reference to the chick as lumpen and fluffy is rather comic and a little childish and enhanced by the assonance of the short vowel a uh, in lumpen and fluffy and this contrasts with the adult bird that we've seen so far MacDonald's feelings are then re relaxed and focused on the emotion of the expression all at once I loved him fiercely the adverb conveys her intense respect for the man MacDonald now has an interest solely in the bird she is to put on the hood she's intimidated a little fearful and that is suggested by the triplet of noun phrases all beginning with her the anaphora of her beak her hackles her wild eyes refocuses our attention on the bird and how intimidating it is but it is also a beautiful bird it's not totally fearful we have the metaphor of the the color of sun on white paper which shows the glorious brilliant and shining life of the bird MacDonald then counts one two three to dramatize the moment that she actually does hood the bird with all her trepidation but she manages it and her thoughts and reactions create a unity or empathy with the bird as she uses the onomatopoeic fizzing and the alliterative fusing to convey a sense of oneness with the bird the fricatives of f and z sound and enhance this in a dramatic moment the finally the formality of tying the braces and caging the bird in its hood allows us to see the narrative come to a close and a rather sudden climax the narrative recount reaches its climax now with dramatically short paragraphs in paragraph 5 the declaratives it was the wrong bird this was the younger one the smaller one show an immediacy and stark truth there is no embellishment here the bold statements and simple comparative adjectives 
simply tell it as it is. Helen MacDonald's reaction to getting the wrong bird is summed up in paragraph six, which is a single word paragraph and an exclamation. The narrator is shocked, dumbfounded, lost for words and speechless as it dawns on her that the bird that she has been enamoured by and captivated with is not the bird that she is to have. Her disappointment, loss of excitement collapses with the cadence of the simple expression, oh. The seventh paragraph turns to the other hawk. It's identified with simple comparative adjectives of larger and older. But this simple fact is contrasted with how she reveals its size. As the mildly blasphemous exclamation, and dear God, it did, which shows how the bird is indeed impressively bigger and shocking. The contrast with the first bird is conveyed in a detailed development of description. The simile, like a Victorian melodrama, suggests an anarchic, excessive, yet sedate exuberance. And the bird's presence is exaggerated in the metaphor, like a mad woman in the attic. This has the connotations of craziness, gothic extremity, and the intimidating fearfulness of the bird that is now before her. The comparatives smokier and darker and bigger are all enhanced by the adverbs much, much, and the size is all. Massively, it is conveyed in the hyperbolic embellishments. And don't forget that she thought the first bird was enormous. There is a contrast in the sounds too, as this second bird wailed in contrast to the smaller birds twittering. Wailed invokes the idea of a huge creature in pain and terror. The sound seemed to be solidified in the words great awful gouts. And the alliteration also enhances it with the hard G. The simile of a thing in pain compares the noise to suffering and agony. MacDonald's response is seen in her simple adjective, unbearable. She knows the larger bird is her hawk, officially, yet there is a denial and a shock conveyed and she can't breathe. There is no connection or relationship with this second bird, which is simply identified with the adjective blank and crazy, and then the noun phrase some madness from a distant country. MacDonald voices her internal thoughts. She dramatises them and we have a stream of consciousness voice, direct and blunt. I didn't recognise her, she says. This isn't my hawk. The last statement returns to the present tense to take us to that moment, to share in it the immediacy of her realisation. It's repeated later in, but this isn't my hawk. McDonald's persona identifies the conflict tension in this drama. She vocalises it in her mind and she recounts the terror and offers a simple noun phrase of slow panic to enhance that. The tension is built and continues now with the streaming questions that she asks. These are shown in red on the screen. There's a torrent of questions as she can't comprehend and understand what, what she can do to change a situation. The final three adjectives describe her state and a self-realization that she is indeed desperate, crazy, incoherent, and they add to the rising tension of the whole section. If we look back at the imagery and the similes and metaphors for the, to describe the second hawk, 
they are extreme, hyperbolic. The bird is not admired. It's shocking, horrific, like a Victorian melodrama, melodrama. It's over the top. And we have these gothic references to the mad woman in the attic, as if this bird is alien, crazy, undesirable. And ultimately, it screeches like a thing in pain. Donald ends this extract with a reflection on herself. A desperate grief, a grief-stricken woman who hopes the bird, her bird, will allow her to find new purpose in life. She represents herself as white-faced, wind-wrenched, exhausted, the triplet of adjectives convey her unease and her predicament. Then she uses the subjunctive comparison, comparing herself to the seaside production of Medea, which conveys both theatrical entertainment, but also extremity, madness perhaps. She should be the powerful um, enchantress of Medea but she sees it more as a Greek tragedy of madness. It conveys the eponymous title of a witch-like sorceress who would like to mend, to wield her power, to change fate. She'd love to be able to switch the birds as easily as that. The extract ends then with a final declarative leaving the situation unresolved and full of suspense in a moment of total silence as she waits to see the Falconer's, Falconer's decision. It ends on, there was a moment of silence. If you look back at your text and you step back from the page, you can see the length of each paragraph clearly. I've coloured them in this slide so that it's quite obvious. You can see the structure. You can see which paragraphs embellish, develop and add detail. And in contrast, those which are terse, undeveloped and full of tension. The sparse words in paragraphs five and six show her speechless shock. If you look at paragraph seven, it reflects her coming to terms with the sight of her larger bird and the anxiety this brings. Studying each paragraph separately and identifying it with a key heading can help to train you to look at the structure and shape, the developing focus and the altering impact that the writing can have on us as readers. So to start with, we have the wrong bird the collecting of the bird, checking it's the correct one, establishing the situation in the setting. Secondly, we have the opening of the box, which is possibly scaring the bird, but there's a sense of power and tension building. And then when the bird in paragraph three is released, the awesome bird, the whole focus is on the power and beauty of that bird and how it is captivating. Then we are shown the respect for the falconer and she develops an, an impressive respect for him, but then the sudden shock of the wrong bird, the simple exclamation and disappointment, the description of the next bird, her reaction, and finally the suspense at the end, wondering what will happen. Will she be able to change it and switch it? Often the impact on us is to do with the values and attitudes that are conveyed through the text. And in this text, there is a strong purpose of joy and emotion for the bird wanting to help it, wanting to rear it. There's a respect for the man who's cared for it and nurtured it, brought it into life. And then there's the doubt about the destiny fate of whether these two, the bird and the woman can be brought together. A sense of mystery ends with the importance of her role in adopting, caring and nurturing. And there's a strong sense of that power of the moment conveyed through the writing. In the exam room for language paper one, you'll be given an unseen non-fiction text that will be paired with one from the anthology. With H's for Hawk, 
consider what you'll need to be able to compare with texts that have similar contents. Perhaps it could, might be another wildlife animal or possibly an experience where someone is shocked or intimidated. Questions one, two and three will be based on the unseen text. So we're going to look at questions four and five now to see what you'll need to do with H's for Hawk. In the exam room for language paper one, when you get to question four, we know that you will be asked to write about one of the prepared texts from the non-fiction section. There are 10 there, so you should know all of them really well. Question four will always ask you the same question. How does the writer use language and structure to interest and engage the reader? You know this in advance, so you can prepare this, learn your terminology and be ready to write about language and structure. Notice it says that you should be writing to explain the interest and engagement for the reader. So you need to think about all the things we've already discussed, like the emotional reaction that the writer has, that she conveys to us as readers, how she positions us to see from different points of view at different paragraphs. Think about all of those things and be ready to write in detail. You'll have 12 marks for this question so they want a long answer and they've allocated 20 plus minutes and given you three sides to write in the exam book. Now, most of you won't write three sides, but you do need to write a substantial answer. Aim to write at least a side, possibly a bit more, but don't worry about the length. It's the quality of your response. You need to be writing precise, detailed comments that address the question. So you should be referring to linguistic literary devices and how the focus and structure of each paragraph shapes your interest as a reader. Try to define the impact at each point. Follow the advice I've given you in this video and you should do really well. Here's the mark scheme for question four. You can see that they put levels or bands of marks these don't relate to your overall level at the end of the course or for the GCSE. They are just levels of marking. But obviously, if you're aiming for a high GCSE, you need to be getting level four or higher. The key words clearly in the mark schemes require you to have a certain amount of information down. The question is testing you on your ability to understand and analyze how writers use language and structure to engage their readers, to achieve their effects. So if you have a very basic or limited response, you are gonna be stuck at level one. Level two is always crucial. You might show some understanding, but it won't be developed, or clearly you've run out of time and haven't written much. So aim to be prepared, know in advance, and write as much as you can that's focused on these particular assessment objectives. Level three is a clear understanding. You know how words work. You begin to explain them, but you might not fully develop them and you might not cover a wide range of devices or effects. To get to level four, you should be showing a thorough understanding. You're exploring a wide range of devices you can label those devices, you can define the impact, and you keep moving on to look at more and more examples. And the very top band shows skill, precision, and a perceptive understanding of how individual words, phrases, or techniques create the effects that the writer is aiming for. Question five on language paper one is the most challenging question. Each question gets progressively harder and some students might struggle to get through the paper to reach these higher mark questions. So try to pace yourself, time yourself and stick with the guidance. The question is compare how the writers present their ideas and perspectives about their experiences. Question five is based on the unseen text and the prepared text that has been identified for question four. 
and you should be looking at how both writers use language and devices to present their ideas and their perspectives or their points of view. To do really well, you have to write a sustained analysis and keep comparing. Don't deal with one text and then the next. Keep looking at how both writers compare whatever they're writing about throughout your essay. You will get 22 marks for this. So that's about 40, 44 minutes. And again, they want a substantial response. So try and write three sides. Aim for a highly developed, detailed, sustained response. Here's the mark scheme for question five. The assessment objective is to explore links and connections between writers' ideas and perspectives, as well as how these are conveyed. So again, you're analysing techniques, looking at how precise points of view are shown, developed and conveyed. The levels are the same. There are five levels. We'll look at four and five in a second. But at the lower levels, you've got a reference for level one, which is limited or undeveloped. You might simply describe things and not explain things. So always try to explain the effect, define the impact of a word or phrase, and you'll immediately move up the scale. Level two is an a candidate who makes obvious comparisons can comment on ideas and perspectives, but doesn't develop those ideas or perhaps look in detail. Notice also the, the mark scheme says if a student only writes about one text, so if you only write about the text you prepared and you ignore the, un, the unseen text, you'll be limited to a level two. Level three shows a range of comparisons between the two texts and you have included some ideas and some details but again you're not developing it fully and exploring the full range of materials across the text. Don't forget to look at the structure of both texts too. Students often go for language devices and they need to look at a range of devices as well as the focus and how it shifts in each text. Question five, levels four and five, you can see that the number of marks has gone up to 18 and 22 at the top level. And again, you need to be looking in detail. There's a wide range of comparisons needed for level four. You're exploring the perspectives, explaining language theme and structure and how they're used across both texts. References are balanced across both texts, so you need to wait and, and share your time between the two texts and fully support each point you're making with evidence. And don't forget the evidence can be a reference to structure or a quotation of a precise word or phrase. Try to use the terminology you know to define those techniques and always explain the impact on how the writer's perspective or point of view or feeling or emotion is being conveyed. Last of all, level five, is highly detailed, perceptive, sustained and thorough work. Notice it says including how theme, language and or structure are used across the text. So a full range of all of the ideas and devices would be needed to get full marks. You're using this material in the classroom, 
you might like to think about the spiritual, moral, social and cultural development that this text encourages to think about, about how we find life beyond death, about how we move through grief to find enjoyment, engagement in the world and how Helen MacDonald does that in seeking to care and nurture for the hawk, but also how she finds wonderment, awe and inspiring moments in the natural world. In the 19th century, the Romantics found joy in the natural world. They called that sense of awe in the face of nature, the sublime. There was a sense of thrill and excitement at traveling to different places to see the wonders of nature in its rawest forms and to enjoy that sublime, sublime which they found nurturing to the soul and to the mind. To end the lesson, you might like to consider what moments of wonder you might miss in your daily life. Think about how you can just stop and pause and look out from the world that you're in to see the beauty that is there. Share some experiences that you've had where you've noticed something wonderful. Mm.